Welcome back, everyone. Good morning. I'm just getting the stream started for now. But uh, as always, good to be with you guys. And um, hope you're having a nice start off to the day. We just have two more minutes, pretty much. And then we can get the, uh, the lecture going. <clears throat> Morning, Stephen. Hi, Ryan. <clears throat> Hope you guys are doing all right. Hi, Amanda. <clears throat> Kylie, hey there. <clears throat> Hey there. <clears throat> Abby, Connor, Ellie, hey, hey everybody. <clears throat> hey Chase, Janya, and Dimitri, good morning. <clears throat> Cole, Claire, welcome all y'all. <clears throat> okay, so let's get started. Welcome back again. A um, couple of quick, um, I guess, points of order. So as you guys know, today the second paper is due, so you should be, should have probably already turned it in. If you haven't yet, make sure to do it with no delay um, to avoid any type of late uh, deduction or anything, but yeah, it's due today, um, and so you should email me that if you haven't already. I think probably most of you have. As I'm getting them in this morning, I'm going through the the inbox and just kind of like uh, giving confirmations back. But anyway, that's all now behind us, and we're down to the last thing, which is the final. I'll be grading this paper obviously over the next week, and as soon as it's all ready, which I'll make sure to get done before finals week, then I'll announce for you that you can. Uh, check in with me for your grade and any student that wants to at that point can just email me and I'll send them their grade with comments if they like and I'll let you know your results on anything else if you also want or your overall grade but anyway um, that's it I also sent the study guide yesterday can anyone let me know um, that you noticed it in your canvas um, announcements from our from our class okay perfect good so that's been delivered out uh, you see the list of questions. There's the first half that was the same as from the midterm, and then the, the second half is just additional questions having to do with the newer material after the midterm. So we'll go over those things next week on Wednesday and Friday. We have two uh, periods that are set aside just for the final exam review. And then, um, you know, I'll try to also maybe make some additional office hours available for anybody that wants to have a chance to ask more questions. Um, during an office hour type of setting, but then we'll just have the exam during finals week according to the date listed and the time listed in the syllabus, which I'm not looking at right now, but I think that it's um, the 18th or the 19th. Um, so material from the midterm will also be included. Yes, there will be material from before uh, the midterm, but most of the material that I will ask you about when I select the questions will be from the second half, but I'm not going to uh, eliminate all mention of the first half of questions. So I will deliberately pick a few from the first half too, just to kind of make sure that's still in there. But there'll be a bigger emphasis on the second half. So anyway, um, okay, so just making sure that everyone's all on top of the schedule. There's not too much left, obviously. We just have another week of meetings. Then you have your final. We have two more lectures, today's lecture and then Monday. And then after that, it's just two review sessions followed by the upcoming final. Um, Okay, so if that's clear enough, and it, it, if there's ever questions, as usual, let me know anytime, and I can um, <clears throat> help clear things up if there's anything confusing or that's not totally perfectly clear. Okay, then, so 
let's continue. We just have to um, go over one more author on the question of what would make a human life go well. Uh, Stephen, your question, are we answering six or seven out of 10? No, it'll be more than that because with the midterm, I had you answer six because you were limited to like an hour approximately of time, like one class period. But for the final, they provide you with two and a half hours. So there's a lot more time. I'm not going to ask like twice the questions, but I will ask just a few more. So whereas for your midterm, you had to answer, I think, six out of 10, maybe I'll make it up to like eight or so, you know, eight questions or something out of a bigger ex set of um, 11 or 12. Okay, so similar, but just a little bit more content just because you do have the benefit of a lot of additional time. So that's all. Yeah. Good question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so then let's just uh, get right back down to it. As I was saying, we're finishing up one more author on the question of what would make a human life go well. No, it's not a Zoom meeting for the final, uh, Nicole. So good question there also. As you did with the midterm, you guys remember the midterm? It's the same. It's the same thing. You're going to be sent the test form, and then you just have to send back your answers before the expiration of the window of time. Um, uh, let's see here. Let's be specific. It's May 18th. That is <clears throat> Tuesday, May 18th, from 1.30 to 4 p.m. So that is the time that is set aside for our final. All you're going to do is just receive the final from me as a you know, class notification through Canvas. It'll contain the document with the questions, and then you just have to write and report your answers and send them to me before 4 p.m. Okay, so make that. hopefully that's all clear enough. No Zoom meeting. I don't know how your other professors are doing things with your finals and stuff, but uh, when we did the midterm, we didn't have any kind of interaction at all. I just sent you the document, and you just sent me back answers. So we'll do the same for the final. Um, okay. So good, thank you for that. And now, <laughs> unless you have more questions, which is fine, let me go ahead and talk about the topic of today's meeting. So we have to finish one last author that deals with their question of the current um, part of our class, which is what would make a human life go well? Is there anything sensible, coherent, objective, rational that could be said about this? Um, and we've looked at two authors with different views about this already. So. Plato said um, from ancient Greece that what brings uh, justice to an individual soul is structurally similar to what brings justice to the state, namely a harmony among the various parts, parts, quote unquote, of the, either the soul or the state. The appetitive part must be ruled by the rational part, and the spirited part must also be guided by the rational part. And he said that such an ordering of the soul where each part exhibits its virtue, working harmoniously and in uh, proper submission to the right rule of the kings, then um, that person's life will be going well, just as the state will be going well. So you defer to your reason, just as in the republic, the lower parts of the republic defer to the kings who act with wisdom. Uh, such an ordering of the soul, he thinks, is what makes life go well, whether or not the individual realizes it. Um, disorder causes the rightful ruler to be captive to the appetites or to your passions. Um, and then after that, we saw Jean-Paul Sartre, who said that we're radically free and we're in total control of whatever we are, uh, that we build our own essence, because according to existentialism, existence precedes essence. Um, he also says that we create our own values and we do that with our free decisions. And so in his mind, there's no answer, therefore, to the question, how should I live apart from whatever you are freely choosing to do? Because when you live your own life, you're constructing a model of what you think the best life is, since each action and each decision reflects your values. Otherwise, you would have done something else. He also makes sure to emphasize that um, with that type of freedom that you have comes responsibility to be aware that your life is in your own hands and you can't make any legitimate excuses for the way your essence is. Um, so today, then, we'll finish pursuing this theme of life and the question of what makes life go well um, with, with, re with reference to this British author named Derek Parfit. Um, so Derek Parfit, he was born in 1942, and he died on, um, I think, actually January the 1st of 2017. So recently deceased, I guess, sort of in the big picture of history, but uh, he's an important 20th century um, ethicist and metaphysician in philosophy. <clears throat> so here we go. Here's our author today, Derek Parfit. 
who lived from 1942 until 2017. And um, the paper that we're reading, that we're studying from him in our book, is just called What Makes Someone's Life Go Best? What makes someone's life go best? Derek Parfit. And this paper was originally written, uh, let me make sure I'm getting it, in, from his book in 1986, Reasons and Persons. Okay. Okay, what makes someone's life go best? This is clearly the number eight. Hopefully it's easier to read and make it be better. Okay. What makes someone's life go best? Derek Parfit. Um, <clears throat> So that's the question that he's pursuing. It's right there in the title. What does make someone's life go best? How do you live your best life? Um, and now each one of us is living a life, obviously. Um, and I think each one of us wants our own life to go as best as it possibly could. So this is something that perhaps you've dedicated at least some time and energy thinking about on your own, since I assume you're trying to have the best life you can have. Uh, I don't know if you have any particular thoughts about this. Does anyone want to throw any random stuff out there? Like, what do you think would have to happen starting right now for you to say, this is it. Life can't get any better. This is the best life I could live. You know, I'm living my best life. Like, what do you think would be the sort of blueprint or recipe for you? Unless you're already there, then maybe you could tell me how your life is going <laughs> since it's the best life possible. But, yeah, just in general, what is the goal? What's the, you know, um, what's the status of having the best life you could live? I mean, in general, like, what kind of things do you think have to be there? I wonder. Any ideas or any thoughts? Look at your own life. Success and prosperity. Okay, Ryan, sure. Prosperity, financial, personal, um, perhaps professional. Success, yeah. Hey there, Eric. Steven, you say you don't think it's so simple, but I kind of practice stoicism, which helps. Well, nothing's simple, right? But I mean, we don't just ignore the question either uh, and just say, nope, can't say anything about it. Um, you say stoicism, Stephen, like you think that uh, to be too attached to things causes the feeling of loss and, and disappointment, so it's better to just kind of let everything flow over you like water, whether it's good or bad. I mean, that's one way to look at life, kind of not to be too, taking things too seriously, I guess. Um, successful and happy, safety and stability, get a job that you like doing. Okay, great, yeah. So it seems like we've all got some different thoughts, and, you know, there's, a, I think, kind of, consensus around a lot of things. You want to live comfortably. You want to live happily. Maybe you want to have certain achievements in your life. Um, you know, maybe you think that moral goodness is, an, is something that you want to strive for as well, live behind a good example for people to follow. Well, all of these are kind of scattered different thoughts, but what Derek Parfit tries to do is to bring some structure to all that. So he says the following. He says, in terms of asking what would make a life go well, you have to consider what would be in your self-interest, right? Because to have a good life is one where your self-interest has been satisfied. So what does promote your self-interest? He says that depends on your theory of self-interest, and he gives three possible theories of that. So he says, first thing, let's try and determine what theory of self-interest that somebody um, assumes or agrees with. So that's the first move of his paper. Let's discuss, he says, three different theories of self-interest, which will each give slightly different answers about what will make a human life go well. Okay, so let's go over that. First of all, <clears throat> so three uh, theories of self-interest according to Derek Parfit. And yeah, what are these things? These are three different accounts of what does boost up your self-interest, like what tends towards your self-interest. So one kind of theory he's, he calls hedonistic theories of self-interest. Okay, now hedonistic theories basically make this claim. They say that what would be best for someone is what would make their life happiest or most pleased. So... What would be best... Um, for someone is what would make their life um, 
um, happiest. Or since it's about hedonistic views, it, happiness is like in utilitarianism, closely connected to the idea of pleasure. So what would be best for someone is what would make their life happiest um, with, you know, or slash most pleasure. Okay, so if you're gonna be a, um, if you adopted this idea of self-interest, the hedonistic theory, then what's the goal of life? How do you win or whatever? You just try to have the most pleasure as possible. So more pleasure, better life. Less pleasure, worse life. So this theory says whatever it is that generates fun, pleasure, excitement, you know, things that you like, then that's the stuff that you should be doing. A pretty simple, straightforward view. And it's kind of similar to the second one below, but it, the second one's slightly different. So let me go over that. Number two, another theory of self-interest. He calls them desire fulfillment theories. Okay, desire fulfillment theories, they basically highlight another aspect of what makes perhaps someone's life go well. What they claim is that what would be best for someone is what would best fulfill their desires throughout their life. Okay, so what would be best for someone, some person, um, is what would best fulfill their desires. Okay, so this one's all about pleasure. This one's about fulfillment of desires. They're kind of similar, but there is a little difference there. Okay, so as I think we've talked about a few times anyway, um, desires, right? They're just things that you want. Um, and of course, if you have a desire, then it's not yet been fulfilled. Otherwise, you wouldn't desire it. Like, so <clears throat> if I had a PlayStation 5 right now, I wouldn't be desiring it because I would already have it. But since I don't have it, I actually do desire it. I'm going to buy it pretty soon. But, um, that's just one random example of some kind of trivial, but desires could be of all kinds of things, big, middle, and small. You might have desires for, um, you know, your college graduation. You want to be a graduate. So that's a desire. And if you get there and you finish, which I'm sure you probably will, then that'll be fulfilled. Okay. So this one just says accomplish, check off, you know, all those uh, desired outcomes that you want. And the more and more of them that you get, the better your life is. So say just for the sake of description, dis discussion that somebody had like 100 desires, 100 different things they wanted. The best life is if all 100 things got satisfied and fulfilled. A worse life has less fulfillment of desire. So it's kind of like on a scale. If you're getting most of your desires fulfilled, this is better rather than less. Uh, but the goal in life then would be to fulfill most or all of them. Now, um, to fulfill desires does, I guess, make you happy in the end, but sometimes the process you have to go through to get to those fulfilled desires is not necessarily happy or pleasant. You know, like as, a, as an example of, you know, in school, you're going to probably be happy to get the degree and all the things that come with that, but along the way, there's a lot of pressure, stress, you know, sometimes the subjects are difficult, sometimes the demands placed on you in terms of your work and your output as a student can be a little bit, um, you know, pressure, stress anxiety, whatever you want to call it. So sometimes not exactly a fun feeling all the way through, although it can be at times too. Uh, but anyway, this one doesn't say it's necessarily about having fun at each moment, but rather just fulfilling desires. Okay. So another way of looking at the best life, if you want to live your best life, according to this standard, go out there and just try to make sure that you can achieve all the different goals, plans, desires that you have in mind. And some of them are big desires and some are little ones. We'll talk about that a little later in the meeting because he goes further into discussion about what the different types of desires you could have could be. But there's a third view too, and that's another one that he puts up here. The third one he refers to he calls objective list theories. So let me try and explain that. Okay, so objective list theories. Um, this one is kind of, like these two have some similarities because they both say if you want something or if it makes you feel good, then you should get it and that'll make your life better. This one's different from both because it says, no, there's things that are objectively good for you. And even if you don't like them, you ought to get them. Okay, so this one says there are certain things that are either good or bad for us 
whether we like it or not, whether we like the good things or whether we don't like the bad things. Okay, so let me write that here. Certain things are objectively, not like just subjectively according to your opinion, but certain things are objectively good or bad for us. Um, whether or not we want the good things or don't want the bad things. So basically whether we like it or not. Okay, so what I've written here, I'll read it so it's clear enough. Objective list theories. Definition. Certain things are objectively good or bad for us, whether we, whether or not we want the good things or whether or not we don't want the bad things. Okay, and so on the objective list theory, just to explain it a little bit better, even more, um, it says there are certain things that are objectively good for you and objectively bad. So focus on the objectively good things for a minute. These are supposed to be things that are not just good according to me or according to you, but they're supposed to be like good, period, like in and of themselves for everybody. That's what it means to be objective. Like it's just a fact, not just an opinion. And um, if that's true, then this theory says, imagine that these objectively good things could all be put in some kind of list. And if you are a follower of this theory of self-interest, then the best thing for you to do would be to try and get all the things on that list. But it's important to notice that even if you don't like those things on the list, the objective list theory says too bad, you should still get them because if you don't like them, something's wrong with you because these are objectively good things. So I don't know, can any of you guys think of things that might be considered like objectively good for a human being? Even if this human being is deviant or weird and they don't necessarily care about those things, what do you think could be, you know, just go go along with the thought, like what do you think could be considered objectively good things for people? Like, I've got some thoughts on this. Okay, you say listening to music, Stephen. That's one thing, I suppose. I wouldn't have been necessarily my first thought because it's something that's kind of optional. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to happen in life, but I understand that. Okay, Nicole, you say health. And I like that one for sure. Let me explain or go into your example for a minute. Can you really think of somebody who says, you know, who cares about health? If I'm healthy or if I'm unhealthy, what difference does it make? Just, I don't care. That's not important. You could say that there are people like that, but you might argue that they're just wrong, that it's just a good thing for them to be healthy. Even if they didn't care about it, even if they didn't want to eat well or exercise, they would be better off if they did. So you can say that to those that don't want to, you know, have health, they're just wrong. It's not like that's a fair opinion. Uh, it's just wrong to not want to be healthy. So the objective list theory might say health could be one of the things on the list and go ahead and get healthy. Even if you're not interested in it and even if it doesn't make you happy, damn it, it's just better for you. You know, like that's the kind of idea here. So health maybe, Ellie, you talk about being moral, being nice to people, one way to put it, but I would kind of make it a little bit more expansive sounding, right? Just morality, to have a good moral um, record and a good moral uh, sort of outlook. You might say that some people don't care about being moral, they'd rather just hurt others as long as they're having fun. But um, if we think that there's anything objective about right and wrong, then you could say morality, health, Probably wisdom. Anyone want to say that? Don't you think being intelligent is objectively good? I mean, I, of course, some people say ignorance is bliss, but it's really not bliss. To be ignorant, <laughs> I mean, you might not know the things that are not going to be good for you, but that just means that you're going to be poorly prepared for them when they happen. So, I mean, I would think of things like intelligence, morality, health, um, probably some degree of uh, financial security, of course, because it's hard to live happily and well without that kind of security. Um, Anyway, look, so if there are objectively good things, then this says go ahead and get them. But it's not saying just do the things that you want because some people don't want those things, right? You know there's some people who say if I had to choose between being healthy and just doing whatever I want in terms of, you know, not working out or not eating well, I'd rather just enjoy the pleasures of those things than to focus on my health. But if the objective list theorist is saying, you know, hearing this thought, they would say, well, it's just bad though that you don't want it and you should get it even if you don't care. So these things say things are making your life better because you either want them or they make you pleased. And this one is saying things should be desired for you because they're already good, not necessarily because you like them or not. 
So get these things because they're good. And in these cases, they're good because you want to get them. Okay, now let me go in, into a little bit more discussion because this is just the initial setup. He states these three different theories of self-interest. And now he tries to give some commentary a little bit more about them. So <clears throat> he says that when it comes to the uh, hedonistic theories of self-interest, there is a little bit of a refinement of it that makes it more plausible. So he says the most plausible version of the hedonistic theory of self-interest is what he calls preference hedonism. Okay, so let me get, uh, go ahead and explain that if I can. So the most plausible variation of this version is what he calls preference hedonism. And preference hedonism just says that um, <clears throat> one out of two actions uh, or one out of two experiences is, mo is more pleasant to a person depending on which one they prefer. So, <clears throat> so um, one of two experiences is more uh, pleasing to a person, creates more pleasure for the person. <clears throat> um, if it is preferred by them. Okay, so which experience is more pleasing out of two? The one that's more pleasing is the one that is preferred by the person. Um, so he only makes this point just because you might wonder, well, what determines which actions are more pleasurable? And he says that that just has to do with the individual. So there's no like <clears throat> objective fact, I guess, then in, in the preference hedonistic view about what does uh, count as the more pleasing option between two choices. And I think that makes perfect sense. So like, here's an example. Suppose that a person has a choice between these two outcomes or, uh, or actions. On the one hand, they could go to like a, um, I don't know, uh, they could stay home and just read a book by the fireside, hang out with like their pet dog, and it's a nice, warm, uh, serene, quiet night, okay? So that's one option. Or they could go out to like a social event um, where let's say everybody's vaccinated. I used to use this example before the pandemic. I don't want you guys to get irresponsible, but suppose that, you know, the uh, other option perhaps pre-pandemic so that we don't have any moral complications, like why do they want to hang out with a bunch of people? But anyway, you remember before the pandemic, I hope. Uh, suppose this person has two choices then. They could stay in a nice, quiet fireside with a book, or they could go out to the social event, which is going to be kind of loud and everyone's socializing, listening to music, kind of like a party. So which one is more pleasant? Uh, well, this is a little bit of a trick question, kind of, and it has to do with the concept here. So what do you think is our answer to that That posed question there. Between staying in or going out, which one is more pleasurable for this person? Can we say? Uh, it depends on something, but what does it depend on? It's all preference, yes. It depends on the person, and different people have different preferences, as you know. Some people, they're quite um, introverted, or maybe they're just a little bit more bookish, and maybe to that person, they think that uh, the loud party is just something that would bring about social anxiety, and it's something that they would really have a uh, you know, a kind of unpleasant experience with, but the thought of being at home really excites them because they love reading and they love those quiet moments. There's other people too, though. Other people are like, what's a book? First of all, uh, no, uh, but I love being out there hanging out, just going crazy with a bunch of friends. Um, so, you know, you got different people to, to the one individual. The first option is way more preferred. So it's more pleasing. And to the other individual, the other is, so we can't say what's more pleasing without knowing the individual's particular preferences. And um, to make that point even clearer, he gives this example from the life of uh, Sigmund Freud. Um, Sigmund Freud, at the end of his life, he was suffering from a lot of different, I guess, medical problems. And he was given prescriptions for, like, uh, powerful pain-killing drugs. And um, he tried them, but after a while, he said, I don't want them anymore. I'd rather have the pain because there was a sort of trade-off. When he was on this, these drugs, his pain was lower. But his, the quality of his thinking was a little more dull, like he wasn't as sharp mentally. And so he didn't like that. So he said, if I had to choose between less physical pain but a sharper mind, um, or wait, like, sorry, more physical pain but a sharper mind, or less physical pain but a dull mind, I'd rather have the sharper mind and take the pain. So 
that shows you that even when it comes to like actual pain, it could be the preferred uh, or more pleasurable um, alternative, depending on the individual's own de de uh, decisions, preferences, and inclinations. Okay, so after that, he talks about the desire fulfillment theory. And he also says this desire fulfillment theory has to be somewhat narrowed down to get into its most plausible version. So he says the most plausible version of the desire fulfillment theory is what he calls the success version. And the one that he thinks is not so plausible is what he calls the unrestricted version of it. Okay, so there's two like different versions of the desire fulfillment theory. One he thinks is a little bit too um, broad, but the other one is just right. So let me go ahead and try to explain the two different variations on the desire fulfillment theory and why he thinks one is better than the other. Um, <clears throat> okay, so desire fulfillment theory. So one version of it he calls the unrestricted uh, version. And that one he says is not right, or it's not at least intuitive. So the unrestricted version says um, <clears throat> all the person's desires count towards what makes their life go better. So no matter what these desires are about, whether they're big, whether they're small, they all matter, I guess, uh, in terms of estimating or um, uh, determining how well their life is overall. So this just says all a person's desires, all of a person's desires, um, <clears throat> matter in determining how well their life is going. But he doesn't think that's the right one. He says this is too broad because it shouldn't be that, sorry, I know I'm getting off camera, you know, it's okay though, but let me tilt this a little bit. Um, he says this is not the most plausible version of the theory because it includes every possible desire that you could have. And he doesn't think that every single desire really does matter towards whether a person's life is going well. So in his view, a more plausible version of the desire fulfillment theory is this other one, which he calls the success version. Okay, so the success version of the desire fulfillment theory says a little bit differently that the only desires that really matter towards the question of how well your life is going are desires that have to do with your own projects and your own goals that you've set. Okay, so... The only desires that matter in terms of how well your life is going are desires about your own projects and goals. That you like started on your own. Okay, so uh, there's what that says. Let me come back to the desk here. Um, so the success version, it says the only desires that matter in terms of how your life is going are desires about your own goals and projects. So the unrestricted version says all these different desires count basically towards the question how your life's going. And the success version narrows them down a little bit. It says there's only some of them that really matter. And as those are the ones about your goals and stuff. Now, um, why does he think that this is the more um, plausible version of it? Okay, so <clears throat> he gives an example to illustrate why he has a problem with the unrestricted version of the theory. It's a kind of a convoluted example. It takes a minute to, to explain, but uh, it's not that hard to understand. So here's how it goes. I want you to imagine that you're just hanging out somewhere like, I don't know, like at a coffee shop or whatever. And um, suppose that you just had a conversation with a stranger there. You guys are just having polite chat. Uh, getting to know each other a little bit while you're both there just having coffee or checking out, you know, the Starbucks or something. And um, suppose then that you kind of end up having polite chat and you end up liking the person and they like you. You're sort of on friendly terms now. But they're about to leave finally after you guys have had your nice interaction. And as they're going to go, this is a total perfect stranger. It's the first time you met them, but they're cool and they're nice. And as they're about to leave, they open up to you and they share something with you a little personal. They say, hey, so thanks a lot for um, just hanging out and talking. 
sometimes we don't get to do that these days, so it's always really nice. And by the way, I just want to say one more thing. I really appreciate all these little moments where we have human interactions. I know I never take them for granted anymore because just a little while ago I received this diagnosis that I'm dealing with a really tough um, like form of aggressive cancer. And uh, you know, I think I can beat it. It's a tough prognosis, but I have a chance. And so uh, anyway, um, you know, I really, really uh, appreciate and value all these little moments where we have friendly interactions with people, you know, since I'm trying to fight off cancer. Okay, so they tell you this. Basically, long story short, this was a nice person that you met out of the blue, and they told you at the end that they're struggling with cancer, but they hope they beat it. So they're leaving, okay, and, you know, that's, you just saw them the one time, just had a nice, polite interchange. Now, suppose that as they're leaving, you form a desire, okay? This is something that you would like to happen, a desire, something that you would want to have happen, and it has to do with them. And the way I've set up the example, maybe you could just guess even what this desire is. If you're a nice person and you really thought this was a, you know, a good human being, then after they told you about their diagnosis, you might have a desire in, in, in reference to them. And what do you think maybe this desire is that I'm hinting at? You maybe would desire for them that what? Following the case that they will, you say, solve their issue in some way. A funny way to put it, though, solve the issue, specifically what's to be solved. Uh, well, that they will, you know, recover from cancer, correct? Um, so <clears throat> you maybe desire that that happens for them, that they beat it, that they can overcome the disease. Now, suppose that uh, as it happens, years pass, you never saw this person again. It was like two ships passing in the night. You just had your momentary exchange, and then you guys go off into your different directions in life never having met each other again. It was just a chance meeting. But suppose that years pass and they actually do beat cancer. So they have recovered. So can, can this straightforward question be answered? If that's happening, then did your desire get fulfilled, right? You wanted them to recover and now years have passed and so it is, they have recovered. So was that a fulfilled desire? Simply just let me know that one. You follow my case. So that's yes or no, did the desire get fulfilled? As you had hoped, they'd recover. Now they have. Uh, so what? <clears throat> Wait, what? Chase, you're saying no. Chase, what do you mean by no? I mean, uh, it, it, it has been fulfilled. You wanted them to recover, and they did. I don't know if I maybe didn't say it properly, but yes, the, the desire is fulfilled. But now... Here's another question though. Okay, do you think this means that the person who had the desire, that their life has gone better? Uh, like now, now is their life better off because this person somewhere out there has recovered from the disease? What Parfit thinks is that this doesn't really count as an improvement in your overall quality of life, even though it is a fulfilled desire. And the reason that he thinks it doesn't count is because it's not a desire that's about your own goals and projects. It's a desire for another person on their behalf that they recover from a disease but even if it's fulfilled, since it doesn't, you know, um, have any relevance to your own goals, projects, something that we could call a success for you, hence the term success version, then he thinks this is not really one of the kinds of desires that we should rule as relevant to the, to the larger question, how well your life is going. So then, to kind of fix these problems, he thinks, let's just modify the desire fulfillment theory so that the right kind of desires that are um, implied by it are those that bear on your own goals projects that you've started on your own and chase well what that's what you were saying okay now I can maybe understand your comment like if a tree falls and no one hears does he get any desire if he doesn't know it recovered yeah I guess well I was talking about just the sentence itself like the sentence they recover from cancer like has become true and it matches the content of their desire which is just I hope that that happens like I can say right now that I have a desire that um, you know something happens that I have no awareness of it happening, but it could be that that desire is fulfilled. But Chase, yeah, I guess we agree on the most part because, or you agree with the author anyway, because what the author says is sort of like what you're saying, that although it is technically a fulfilled desire, his way of putting it is that, yes, it's fulfilled, but it doesn't really count towards your um, bettering of your life or you know an improvement in your quality of life, right? So he thinks the right kind of desires that should be referred to are the success ones. But let me add one little extra complication for you there, Chase, and for everybody else. He does say this, though, that if the desires are about your own projects and goals, and Stephen, let me get your comment, but what if you don't have control 
and you are so kind and you take it so deeply, it becomes your goal. Well, uh, it is your goal though. I mean, okay, you're saying if it's a success about you because this, well, then it would have to be a closer person to you, I think, like a family member, um, a friend. He takes it as, so I guess what you're doing, Stephen, is interesting. You're, you're drilling into like, well, what is the definition of your own goal or your own project? Like someone else recovering from cancer, is it my project or goal? I don't think that that would be the proper way to describe it, though, if I just had one chance interaction with them. Now, if I worked with them and if I like dedicated myself, if I'm like their nurse, if I'm their doctor, then their recovery could be seen as extent as coextensive with a goal of my own. Um, but do you kind of see where at least Parfit's trying to lead the reader? He's trying to get the reader to think that intuitively common sense tells you there's only some desires that really reflect on the quality of your own life. And they have to have they have to do with your own goals. Now, if I modified the example like you did, Stephen, then maybe we would get a different intuition. But as, in his original presentation of the example, he thinks most would agree that this is a desire that doesn't really uh, count as a goal or a project of yours. It's just a desire, but it pertains to someone else and their circumstances. But what I was just going to say right before that is that if you have a project or goal that you started then even if it's fulfilled in a way you can't become aware of, he thinks that still counts towards the quality of your life. So it's not so much the unawareness of it being fulfilled, Chase. It's rather that it's not your own project, according to Parfit anyway. So he gives like examples, like think about if you started a business, right? And you start this business and when you do that, anybody, of course, almost by definition, has the desire that the business is successful and that it's profitable, right? It makes a lot of money. Why else would you start the business if you didn't want that? So that's a desire of the business um, entrepreneur. Suppose, though, that as they start this business, unfortunately, they're tragically, they pass away before they can see how far it goes. But suppose that after they, they die, the business explodes and becomes this huge company that's making tons of money on the stock market and it's getting a lot of people rich. Um, and this was the founder. He says that if that happened, then that should be credited towards the person's quality of life, even posthumously but only because it's their own project or goal. So you could see it as like a success, even though uh, the fulfillment of the success they were not aware of seeing happen. So that's a kind of interesting little twist. Um, or if you had kids, for example, you know, you have a desire for the kids to thrive and prosper and have good lives. And suppose you passed away before you could see them grow up because, you know, something happened tragically in their youth to you. He says, well, if they ended up, you know, killing each other, and then that would be an unfulfilled desire. So that would you know, redound to the negative uh, side of your quality of life. But if they ended up having great prosperous lives, then that would also be something that you started at least, and it would be extensive with your own goals. Um, okay, so um, the next thing that he talks about a little bit are two different types of uh, desires. Um, and what he talks about are what he calls local versus global desires. So that's like another distinction within the uh, desire fulfillment theory. Let me try to talk then about those concepts, the local and global uh, quote-unquote desires. <clears throat> so I'm going to erase a bunch so that I can kind of create more room now. <clears throat> okay, so two types of desires now from the world of the writings of Parfit. We have what he calls local, and then there's global. Now, this is not local and global like literally in terms of geographic uh, extension, like local in your own community versus global internationally. No, it's used in a sort of different sense. Local just means like particular desires that are in the short term. So local desires are desires for particular things that you can more or less satisfy in the short term that you can get pretty quickly. So that's local desires. Desires for particular things that you can fulfill in the short term. So these are not like the big picture, like life goals. They're more basic little things that you can get on the daily. But then you've got the global desires, and those, he says, are the big ones. Those are the ones that you – these are desires about things um, that you carry with you through your whole life or a significant part of it. So – 
desires for things that are about one's whole life or a large part of it. Okay, so local and global desires. Um, so the global desires are about your whole life rather than your particular circumstances. And the local desires are about something particular in the here and now in the short term. So let me try and test you on uh, your understanding of those. If I say to you that I have a desire right now as I'm thinking about lunch, and I'm thinking I want to get some tacos for lunch today, which kind of desire do you think that would be? Because I kind of do feel like I would like them. There's this new taco place in Long Beach where I live. And anyway, that's a local desire, yeah. Um, and I can, and I probably will satisfy that just in a couple of hours. So once I get the tacos and I've eaten them, I say, nice, mission accomplished. I wanted them, now I've got them. Or if I want the PlayStation 5, like I told you guys about, that's another little local desire. It doesn't take like a life, uh, a life of striving and toil and consistent dedication for that to happen. I just need to cobble together, what is it, 500 bucks or something, 600 bucks, and then I can have the, the console. So local desires, things that you can get, objects, possessions, quick things, right? But we want things like that all the time, and I'm sure you can, you can relate to different examples of your own. Now, global desires. What if I say to you I have a desire to have a family, um, and I want to have a happy family? I do kind of have that desire, actually. You know, I've been getting married not too long from now, maybe next year, already engaged and stuff. So this is something I've dedicated a lot of thought to. But anyway, all of us have our own lives. What do you think about that? Having a happy family and stuff, starting a family and then having a happy family. What's that, local or global desire? <clears throat> it's global, right? Because you can't just say, hey, I've got a couple errands I want to do today. Let me check off this one. Have a happy family. Done. On to the next. What else can I get done before lunch? No, uh, that's something that takes a lifetime because not just getting married and finding the right partner, but then maintaining uh, the integrity of the relationship and making sure that it's a lifelong thing. And that takes maintenance, care, dedication throughout one's life. So it's not just like a short-term goal. What if I want to say I'm, I want to be healthy? I want to be a good, healthy person. I want to have good health and be fit. Would you say that's a local or a global desire? <clears throat> It's also something I desire for myself, and that's another global desire, correct, because you can't just say, look, I've got a couple hours, I'll just take care of my fitness, and then that'll be out of the way, and then I never have to do it again. No, because fitness, as you know, takes work just to get there, and then maintenance to keep it. So um, whether it's lifelong health, um, having a happy family, getting an education, holding down a career, having friends, that you have friendships that you want to have like last and be durable, those are big global desires. So anyway. Um, both of these desires kind of animate our lives and push us to get the things that we want. But according to Parfit anyway, all right, he thinks that one of them is more important than the others. And so when he looks at that desire fulfillment theory, he thinks that the success version is the more plausible version and the more important kinds of desires that he thinks add the most to the question how our life is going or which of the two. Um, I guess, spoiler alert, I'll just let you know, even if you're about to type it, that the global desires are the ones that he thinks have greater weight. They're more important. And so he thinks that your best life, if you're going to follow the desire fulfillment theory, would be to satisfy all of your big projects and goals, which we could call global desires. Um, and he tries to make the case through some examples here that the global desires do matter more than the local ones do. Um, he tries to make the case by giving examples where I could you could trade um, a greater quantity of the local desire fulfillment for blocking the satisfaction of some of your global desires. And he thinks that anybody who would take such an offer would be doing themselves a disservice. And if you think about it yourself, you'll agree. So like, here's one example that he gives. Um, it's a weird example, but that's philosophy. So anyway, he says, imagine that um, I tell you, or I wouldn't tell you this, but somebody tells you, hey, here's a proposition for you. I would be willing to, if you let me, inject you with this drug. And it's like it's an intoxicating drug. It's a lot of fun. Once you get this drug uh, injection, you'll become a straight-up addict immediately. Uh, so what that means is every day after that from the first injection, you'll wake up each morning. And when you wake up, your mind will be fixated on one thought, which is a desire for something. 
And if you're following what I'm saying, then maybe you already know that the desire being mentioned is the desire for the use of the drug and the effect of its, you know, um, intoxication. So anyway, it's like, I'm offering to make you into a drug addict. Will you let me give you this injection? Because if you do, then you'll wake up each morning with a new desire to use it again. Now you might say, how could that possibly be good for me? But there's a little twist, I've got more. So not only would I give you the injection the first time, causing you then afterwards to be an addict, but don't worry about it because I'm gonna give you a lifetime supply of this drug. So I'll have truckloads of bricks of this stuff and you'll never run out. So every morning when you get this desire, I'm giving you the means and the supply to satisfy it. So what I'm basically saying is, I'll set you up for life so that you'll have a bunch of little local desires for the effect of the drug, but every time those local desires pop up, you can fully fulfill them because you'll have unlimited supply of the same drug. So question, is this making your life better? Does that proposal sound like a proposal to improve your life from here going forward? And I mean, maybe some of you are funny, but I think to be honest, most all would probably agree that that's not going to make your life better, but it is going to be a lot of desire fulfillment, but it's which kind of desire fulfillment? It's local desire fulfillment because it's the desire associated with taking a drug in the here and now and feeling the effect. Um, so you get a lot of like local desire fulfillment, but you would block the fulfillment of a global desire. Okay. And what global desire is being set back when you become a drug addict? Well, maybe your desire to maintain your lifelong health and non-addiction status. And that's something that you can't just say you've already done because it does take a lifelong kind of um, vigilance over your health and safeguarding against any tendency to fall into a pattern of addiction. So this doesn't make your life better because it's giving you more quantity of desire fulfillment, local ones, but it's de depriving you of a more qualitatively important global desire. And so he thinks if you see this as a bad trade-off, a bunch of local desires to be fulfilled, but at the cost of a global one, and you think that's a bad trade-off, then you would agree with him that the global desires matter more if they are going to be compared against or traded off against by the local ones. And so the same kind of argument would hold for any scenario in which you, you could um, opt for more local desire satisfaction, but it would set back some of your big goals. So think about people who say like, I don't know, I really want to travel the world right now, so I'm going to just drop out of school. You know, So maybe they're going to get a lot of local desire satisfaction through that time period that people are not having when they're studying, but then they you know, set back the pursuit and the accomplishment of a bigger goal that would have mattered more for them. Or like drug addicts actually do, not forget this silly example he gives, but a lot of people that find themselves addicted, they have to give up on other big life goals because they're just so caught up in the pursuit of these little particular ones. So he thinks that these examples kind of indicate that the global desires have greater weight and they matter more. Therefore, that's why he does assert that um, the most reasonable version of desire fulfillment theory says to pursue the big goals in the success version of the theory. There's a little more on this um, author, so I will have to take a couple minutes on the beginning of Monday to finish it. But we have enough time Monday to finish this and then also to talk about one more piece. So in the text of the syllabus, it originally said that we would be all the way to two articles by Nagel, The Absurd and Death. Here's what I'm just telling you right now in the meeting. Let's take off The Absurd and we'll make Death the last article on Monday from Thomas Nagel. So read Death and finish Derek Parfit and those two things we'll cover on Monday. And that'll be our last lecture-based meeting. After that, we'll do review sessions. So we're low on time, we're out of time. But uh, if everything's good, let me hear that in the chat and then I can close this one. And you can have a nice weekend and we'll be in touch on uh, Monday. So is everything fine? Okay, thanks so much, uh, Nina. Thanks so much to all the others. Uh, have a good one then, and I'll be in touch after the weekend. If you need anything, please email me. Okay, guys, bye-bye. <clears throat> Hi, hello. I'm